Uh, glad you guys are here. We're going to be uh, looking at Revelation chapter 8 today, and each week I think, well, maybe we'll have a little bit of a reprieve as far as uh, a massive amount of information, and this week, although we only have 13 verses in this chapter, I didn't know how I was going to fit it all in, so good news, I was able to make the font smaller on the text. It's all in there now. Um, that being said, you need to get the message notes out of your program. Um, you will not be able to follow this rambling um, unless you have notes and are, it can see what we're talking about. It would be difficult to just listen to it. It would be difficult really just to even follow through in the passage itself because we're going to be jumping around a little bit and let Scripture interpret Scripture and uh, understanding kind of the perspective of what's going on in this chapter. So please get out your message notes. And if you don't, it's your own fault. Um, one of the things I want to do as we go through the series is to get the idea of what's going on in this book. I want you to have a sense of at least the flow of the book, whether you uh, uh, like the way I'm interpreting or it or not. Uh, I would like you to at least be familiar with the book, to know what are the elements of the book, even if you have a, a different way of interpreting it. Um, and so by the time we're done with this, I want you to have a sense of, oh, I know where that happens and why that happens and how that's connected to that, so that at least you will have an understanding if someone were to give you some interpretations, you might go, well, that doesn't jive with how the whole book flows together. So um, just by way of uh, r reminder, um, we start with an intro. We did the seven letters to seven churches. We're taken up into the throne room vision where we're introduced to the Lamb who was worthy to open the seven seals on the scroll. Then in the next chapter, chapter 6, six of the seven seals are broken. Those first four seals, do you remember who they were? The horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and then we have uh, the next chapter, chapter 7, which answers the question, who can stand? Um, as we read about this uh, the condemnation that was coming on those who've rejected their Messiah. We find out that those who can stand are those sealed people, uh, Christian Israelites, um, who uh, are protected, and then also the multitude that had given their lives and stand before the throne. And so we're kind of given that perspective as we, we get up to the opening of the seventh seal, finally. Today, that's what we will be talking about the opening of this seventh seal. And I hope that as we walk through this, you kind of get a sense of the flow and understand the elements and how they all fit together in this book um, so that you are better able to understand uh, not only my interpretation of this book, but other interpretations of the book as well. Let's take a moment and pray and ask for God to, to give us some insight as we look at chapter 8 this morning. Father, thanks for uh, this opportunity to understand your word. I pray that by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and by the word that you conveyed 2,000 years ago, we might get a sense of what this book means to the very first readers and the impact it would have on their lives and what impact it may have on our lives today. Help us to be faithful to your word and communicate it in a way that is honest and consistent with Holy Scripture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are opening that seventh seal, and by way of introduction, remember that uh, the last chapter, chapter 7, concluded with a view of the multitude, the, the martyrs that stood before the throne. I think that's helpful for us because we'll, hear, we'll feel a connection with those martyrs as we go through this chapter. It will follow on with a bit of their story. Um, and then we get to the first verse of chapter 8. It gets right on it and says, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, this is, to me, one of the more powerful verses in this book. You get the sense of awe, of wonder. Um, we could maybe equate it to you know, your favorite football team's in the Super Bowl and they're down by uh, two points and they're kicking a 50-yard field goal with one second left and it, the ball comes off the kicker's foot and you go, everything stops. 
as you wait to see the outcome. Now, here's the thing. This outcome is not in question. Our team wins. Um, Jesus is about to do something, but this sense of wonder of this is the moment that we've all been waiting for. Here it is, and everyone just stops. You ever been in some place where there's a lot of noise, a lot of noise, something happens, and everyone gets quiet instantly? What? Well, everyone's focused on something. And here we see all of heaven silent as they say, now it's going to happen. Now, uh, this particular um, verse leads me to, or leads me to interpret uh, part of Revelation in a way specific to a response to this silence. And I'm going to say it this way. Remember, um, all of these things were written before the calamity of the Jewish-Roman War. And so I've tied a lot of what we've been seeing with that war. I want to be clear, this was not just a commentary on what was happening. This was all written before that. So when I share the things that Josephus records that happened, they were predictions at the time of their writing. This was stuff that was going to happen. And as we talked about, the the seven-sealed scroll was a judgment seal filled with uh, uh, the the, the de- decision that Ju- uh, Judah, uh, the people of Israel, those who rejected their Messiah, were guilty. And so I believe what was happening in the first seven seals is that as each seal is broken, it's not that the action is being taken, but it's that the it's the preparation. It's the reading of the scroll, if you will. It's the these are the. It's a proclamation of what is going to happen. And when the seventh seal is broken, now the scroll is opened, and the action begins. Now there are other people who would interpret this, say, no, each one is progressive, and so with each seal, this thing happened, and so you have three significant groups of seven in the book of Revelation, the seven seals that we've talked about, the seven trumpets, which we will begin talking about in today's chapter, and then the seven bowls. And you can interpret these somewhat differently in that you could say, well, these seven happened, and then these seven happened, and these seven happened all in this order. Um, Another way to interpret it is these seven happened, and then this is the same seven, but from a different perspective, And then these is a a different perspective. And so there's kind of different ways to interpret those things. But the reality is, as long as we have a common thread leading us, and in this case, I believe the common thread would be these things all had a significant meaning and impact on the first century readers that this book was written to, meaning those seven Uh, churches in Asia, that it had an impact on first century Christians. Therefore, when we read these things, what did it mean to them? Because this letter was to them. Um, If we have that common theme, I think you'll find that whether these things kind of happened one right after the other or um, in progression, etc., it doesn't vastly change your interpretation of these events. Um, My interpretation here is that breaking of the seventh seal, the silence is... Now it's gonna. Now it goes. The the scroll, in the very nature of a scroll, would imply a reading, a proclamation, and so I believe, and I you know wouldn't uh, die on this hill, but I believe the first seven seals are just breaking of the seals that indicate this is what's going to happen, and then we have trumpets, and we'll talk about the trumpets in just a second. Um, uh, this idea um, is we are once again taken today to the throne room of God, uh, to the heavenly throne room, to the heavenly temple. Um, and if you remember, we were introduced to the idea of prayers of the saints. Um, in Revelation 5, 8, um, this is the throne room passage in, in uh, Revelation chapter 5. And it talks about when the lamb takes the scroll, and it says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, 
which are the prayers of the saints. Here we see this throne room of God that there are these bowls of incense, which are not bowls of incense. They're prayers of the saints. And so we're taken to this throne room, and this symbolically represents the prayers of the saints. And this idea of incense being used to communicate our prayers is common with many religions, and certainly with uh, historic uh, Judaism and with uh, traditional Christianity, um, particularly older school Christianity, this idea of um, using incense. The idea being that it be uh, that the smoke rises up with our prayers and creates a sweet aroma. So God says, that smells good. I'll answer that prayer if I can dumb it down a little bit. But that's the idea. We see it even in... Uh, the Gospels, when Zechariah, who is the father of who we would later call John the Baptist, Zechariah is in the temple, and he offers incense. This is what it says in Luke 1, 8 and 9. Now, when he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Here he is in the Holy of Holies, and he is lighting incense as a, and praying for his people, the nation. In the very presence of God, he is burning this incense, and this is the idea that happened on the temple in, on earth. Now we're reading about it happening here in the temple in heaven. And in fact, as we think about what's going on at the temple of heaven, we even know what the prayer of the saints is. It's shared with us in chapter 6, uh, Revelation chapter 6, looking at when the fifth seal was broken, uh, we see uh, the martyrs, and it says, They cry out in a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. How long will you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Here is an account of those who had lost their life for their faith, and they are saying, When will it be made right? And I, I want to tie in this idea with those first century readers. If you're a first century reader, if you're a member of the church at one of the seven churches in Asia, and you read this, and you know people who have lost their lives, Christians, brothers and sisters who have lost their lives for their proclaiming their faith, and you read this, you realize it's those people who are saying this prayer to God. And they're saying, how long until you avenge the blood on those who dwell on the earth? Clearly, the first readers would not say, well, well obviously, this means their an the, the people who oppressed them, their ancestors 2,000 years later. Clearly, it's talking about those who did these things to these first century Christians who are indeed experiencing tribulation and persecution and death. Uh, moving on, we get the sense of this idea as we read in Revelation chapter 8 starting at the second verse. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And I want to, I want to touch on this. First of all, there's this idea that there are the seven angels. The significance is they stand before God. Seven obviously representing the number of completeness and perfection, and that these angels were close to God. In fact, in that same passage I just talked about, where Zechariah is in the presence of God, he is re it was revealed to him by an angel that he would have a son and he should name him John. Do you remember that angel's name? Don't be afraid. Can't be that many choices, Daniel. right? Thank you. God bless you. You must have gone to seminary. <laughs> Gabriel. Gabriel reveals this. And remember, Zechariah doubts it. And then what does Gabriel say? I stand in the presence of God. Gabriel is known as an archangel, one of those who are especially close to God. And so here, no doubt, Gabriel is one of these seven. The seven angels who stand before God, and they uh, are given seven trumpets. And what's significant here is they don't do this on their own authority. It's not like the angels are like, hey, let's go get some trumpets. God is in control of this situation. God gives them trumpets. 
God is leading their actions. And so they are given seven trumpets. Trumpets are traditionally the way in the Old Testament uh, to call to action. Oftentimes it was to call the army together. Other times it was to call the group while they were um, wandering through the wilderness to give them directions or to, to give orders. But it is a call for action. And notice the significance of the symbolism of a trumpet, which is a call to action, and a scroll that is a proclamation. I think those symbols are somewhat significant, at least in my understanding of how we are to read these two different uh, sections. And then it says, another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. Now, censers, we don't use that, at least we don't use that word this way. A censer basically is like an incense burner. You guys ever have one of those, you hippies? You guys know? <laughs> Just any kind of thing that you put incense on, you burn it. That's a censer. And we've probably seen like um, the, the Catholics are, and Orthodox Christians use those things. They swing and the, the incense smoke comes out. Censer is just something you put incense in to burn it. Um, So they're at the altar in heaven with the golden censer, much like Zechariah was on the altar on earth and burned incense for the prayer of the saints. And he, this angel, was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Here you get the sense that this prayer that we just read that came out of uh, chapter 6, when will you avenge, um, here we get the sense their prayer is being heard and is about to be responded to. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, here probably better translated land, the land of Israel. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning in an earthquake. These things are representative of God's power and majesty and his judgment. Um, we had, we've already read these words in Revelation, comparing scripture to scripture. In Revelation chapter 4, right at the very beginning of this vision of the throne room of God, if you remember, it's a description of God's power and majesty and authority because he is the one who sits upon the throne. In Revelation 4, 5, it says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and uh, peals of thunder, this whole idea that God is bringing about judgment. The one who sits on the throne is bringing his judgment on earth. And it's significant to notice that the censer is filled with fire from the altar. This is holy fire. This is the judgment fire of God. And we will see things burning throughout this book. And we recognize that they're burning has come about by the holy fire of God in the throne room in the temple of God. This idea of holy fire was even used by uh, early Jews when they were going in and and capturing cities, and um, they would come into a city where great rebellion had happened and people were against God, and instead of just conquering it, they said, no, bring, bring everything together, all the valuable spoils. Don't bring them back with you. They've like been tarnished, if you will. Put them in a pile in the city and burn them with holy fire, fire from the altar of God, so that they might these items might be an offering to the Lord. This is what it says in Deuteronomy thirteen, sixteen. You shall gather all its spoil into the midst of an open square and burn the city and all its spoil with fire as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. Here is a a picture of the angel in heaven taking the holy fire from the, the altar in heaven and throwing it down upon the land as a form of judgment. This judgment is about to begin. We're going to look at seven trumpets. And does anyone think of a story about when you hear seven trumpets in the Old Testament? He said something that you didn't like. What did he say? My Trump, my people, good band? Oh, for a good band. Yeah, it would be a good band. 
Um, <laughs> very brassy. Um, <laughs> anyone else? Jericho, the Battle of Jericho. Is that what you meant? Yeah, okay. Um, the idea of Jericho, right? There were lots of sevens in Jericho, this idea of the, 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 the seven days walking around, um, that seventh day walking around seven times. And we see seven priests holding seven trumpets and blowing a horn. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And what happens? The walls come a-tumbling down, 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 right? (laughs) Destruction upon the city of Jericho because of the seven trumpet blast. Here we see seven trumpets as Jerusalem is about to fall. The seven trumpets of God, and notice he says in verse uh, 6, oh wait, I want to tell you one other thing first. Um, One of the things you'll see as we look at these first four trumpets today, um, that each of the trumpets has a description of things that are happening to the land of Israel um, and to Jerusalem in particular, Um, and each of them is associated with the plagues that God sent to Egypt. Um, And this is a a symbol of you were the oppressed. My people were the oppressed. Now my people have become the oppressors. That you are the oppressors of those who have truly trusted in Christ, those who are, are truly the new Israel, as the New Testament describes. I shouldn't say new Israel. The true Israel, the continuation, because many of those people were the old Israel as well, and they trusted in Christ and continued to be Israel. Um, And so we see in Revelation chapter 11 where God specifically calls the city of Jerusalem Egypt. Listen to what it says in Revelation uh, 11. We're going to get there in a few, well, in a while. Um, (laughs) The great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. There's a clear indication here that God is saying, just as you were oppressed, just as my people were oppressed, you have become, the, the uh, Jewish state has become the oppressors of my people. And that's what we see um, working out here. And we'll see in the first four trumpets allusions to the plagues of Egypt that God called his people out of as they oppressed them. So verse 6 says, Now the seven angels who, were, who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. So here, now they're ready. There's been this judgment, this fire thrown upon the land, and they prepare to blow the seven trumpets. And the first trumpet is a curse of the land that there's a lack of vegetation, which obviously leads to famine, which is associated with uh, the horsemen, if you remember. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire, one of the plagues that God sent to Egypt. Mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, land, and a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, you'll notice with each of these uh, uh, calamities, we see that a third is impacted. Now, don't be confused into thinking, well, if you measured the square footage, you would find it exactly one-third was burned up. That's not what's going on here. It's saying that there was an impact, but that impact was controlled. That God actually was in control, and it wasn't a total annihilation but there was an amount of impact that God allowed them to have that was not complete yet. And so we see this idea of a third, and um, and then the second uh, uh, trumpet has to do with the cursing of the sea, and I'll explain this, but I believe this sim- symbolizes a lack of an ability to escape this judgment. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures of the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. 
Here, I want you to pay attention for just a moment this idea of something like a great mountain burning with fire being thrown into the sea. First of all, what is it not being thrown into the sea? A great mountain. It's something like a great mountain. We're going to talk about that in a minute because there is a really interesting connection between Jesus' teaching and this particular uh, uh, consequence of the trumpet being blown. But one of the things we know from the first century is that some Jews tried to escape Roman's occupation because it wasn't just in Jerusalem, it was in the whole area of Israel, by getting on ships and trying to get out of the land. And we know from Josephus historically that they were massacred on the seas. And he talks in graphic detail about the bodies washing up on shore and the ships being destroyed. And I think this is symbolic of the fact there was no escape by sea. That's the significant aspect of what's going on here during this judgment. And then third, we see cursed rivers and springs, which creates a lack of drinking water, which, by the way, did happen in Egypt. Um, The the Nile was turned to blood, and they were not able to drink that water, which leads to dehydration and death. And the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water, The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Uh, There's a fascinating element here, not only the dehydration being tied with the the curse on Egypt, but also uh, the the concept of Wormwood. Now, Wormwood was an actual plant um, uh, at that time, and it was something that the extract of would be very bitter and at times potentially poisonous. And the idea being that the water would be so bad that people would either die from lack of being able to, to, to drink it uh, or that it was actually even poisoned. This was a common practice for the Romans when they would do a siege of a city. They would cut off their water supply. They would poison their water supply um, to... Uh, uh, it, make it difficult for them to survive in a siege situation. And part certainly this is part of what was going on here. But there's another element that's interesting. If you take this idea, God is saying, I will make the waters bitter. When the Israelites were escaping Egypt, they came upon bitter water. Do you remember that account? And God made it clean. Here we see the flip of that. As we look at the plagues of Egypt and God's um, uh, working with them, this idea that he puts this idea on its head, that before he made the waters uh, bitter, clean for his people, now he's taking and he is treating them like Egypt and taking clean water and making it bitter. And then the fourth trumpet, having to do with the curse of creation and One way of thinking about this is the idea that God created the universe and now all the the major things in the universe are being broken down, are not working properly. And this idea of lack of hope. Um, The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars. So the third of their light might be darkened, a third of the day might be kept from shining, a third and likewise a third of the night. The, if you remember, darkness was one of the curses in Egypt. And also, one of the things that we see in apocalyptic language, and we've talked about this through multiple series now, this idea that when we talk about these cosmic uh, consequences, they are uh, usually referring to kings or kingdoms. And in fact, we see during this time a great upheaval in rulers and authorities during this period of time, during the Jewish-Roman War. In fact, last week I even brought up the idea of the four emperors in one year. Such was the up and down of the Roman leadership at that time. Uh, Suffice it to say, each of these things represent things that Rome was doing in their occupation. They brought about uh, a famine and lack of... um, Uh, plants. Um, They burned many things. Much of what they were doing was making it so that life was very inconvenient for people in the city of Jerusalem. 
Um, and in the midst of this, we get this sense that God is working to bring about his kingdom and bring an end to the old sacrificial system. So one of the questions is, well, why is God doing that? Why is God bringing about the end of the sacrificial system? And why is he doing it 40 years after Jesus' resurrection? Assumedly, Jesus' resurrection, death and resurrection brought about an end to the need for temple worship. And any temple worship after Jesus' death and resurrection would be blasphemous. This is an interesting thing Jesus says in his teaching. And he's teaching about a fig tree. And by the way, Jesus used the, the term fig tree as a reference to the nation of Israel. And if you've read about Jesus in the last week of his life, he comes back uh, in the, uh, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, and he teaches during uh, a week uh, before his crucifixion. And almost everything maybe everything he says during that week is about the nation of Israel rejecting him and there being a new people grafted in to true Israel. Um, And so as a part of that, in Matthew 21, Jesus uh, curses a fig tree representing Israel. And the the, the fig tree in Matthew, it, it immediately withers And the disciples are like, wow, that's a great trick. How did you do it? And Jesus say, truly I I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive it if you have faith. Does that sound familiar to anybody? A mountain being thrown in the sea? Here's the fascinating thing. Jesus doesn't say, even if you have, uh, you, e- even if you say to a mountain, he says this mountain. He's talking about the mountain on which Jerusalem is built, where he is. This mountain that had been caught on fire by holy fire, thrown down by the angel from heaven. This thing like a burning mountain that is thrown into the sea, and all of this is done in response to what? The prayer of the saints, which he says, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive. It's an interesting connection that takes two passages that seem really odd on their own, and when you put them together, it seems to make very good sense. Uh, We'll see also this idea of uh, Israel being represented by a fig tree when Jesus says in Luke 13, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well, and good. And if not, you can cut it down. Now, what's fascinating here is this, everyone would agree, this is a, a, a talking about the nation of Israel who has rejected the Messiah. What's interesting here is the idea of Jesus saying that they are given another opportunity. And what's fascinating is from the time of Jesus' death, resurrection, to the time of the destruction of the temple is 40 years of opportunity. Many Jews came to faith during those 40 years. And by the way, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's 40 years. 40 years is symbolically in the Bible a time of testing. Jesus, remember, Jesus, uh, the number 40, 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus was tested familiar with this? Go like this, just so I know somebody's still here. Um, 40 years uh, of wandering, wilderness wanderings because of their disobedience. Uh, We have uh, the judgment taken onto the world, and we have 40 days and nights of rain. There's lots of other 40s like this. Um, It's fascinating that it seems as if this prophecy is one that the nation of Israel is given the opportunity to receive their Messiah, 
before the destruction comes on the city of Jerusalem, and they're given that 40-year period, 30 AD, from the time that the sacrifices no longer mattered in the temple. And in fact, I would say they mattered in a negative way to the time where that temple was destroyed and not again since 70 AD has there been a sacrifice on that temple, in that temple. Um, interestingly, uh, the conclusion of this chapter, which sounds pretty bad, it sounds like things are pretty rough, right? There's this Im- impression as we close off this chapter that, well, yeah, that's bad, but you haven't seen anything yet. Then I looked and I heard an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Um, It's going to be bad. You, You saw these four. Now there's going to be three that are really bad. The three woes. Um, Interestingly, we see in this chapter that the four are disconnected from the other three. If you remember, the seven uh, seals, the first four were horsemen, and the the other three were separate. Um, Here we see the first four are a specific set, and then there is a reference to the last three being somewhat different. Um, And fascinatingly, it is an eagle who cries this. And by the way, when the Romans came in to conquer Jerusalem, what was on the top of their staff that flew their flag? An eagle. Um, This idea of the woes for those who dwell in the land. So we will be reading about three more trumpet blasts in the weeks ahead. But with that in mind, let's take a moment and hear chapter 8 and reflect on understanding what these words mean sort of in context. Uh, Sam and Kara are going to read it for us. Revelation chapter 8. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints, and on the golden altar before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. As we read these passages with the mindset of the first century church, those who are suffering, those who are experiencing persecution and hardship, we can't help but think that they recognized that although times were hard, that they might die for their faith, 
God is in control. And not only is God in control, but God is bringing an end to this false temple worship, and he is bringing about his kingdom, the kingdom of God, that was promised in Daniel. If you remember, he he brought about this kingdom, and for this 40-year overlap, we have the establishment of the new covenant, the establishment of the kingdom of God in which Christ rules, and then for 40 years we have this, this overlap from when the temple sacrificial system is completely destroyed and not able to be practiced anymore. In the midst of all of this, we are um, encouraged that God is establishing his kingdom. As Daniel said, the fifth kingdom, the kingdom of God that would supplant the four earthly, worldly kingdoms. That's what Revelation is recording for us as we look at these words. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we think about those early brothers and sisters in Christ and their own difficult challenges in life for those who struggled and lost their lives and uh, were tortured and met in catacombs hiding for their faith, Father, I pray that uh, you might help us to be all the more mindful of the grace that you have shown us the way that we are able to gather together freely today and proclaim your kingdom and your majesty, that we might become a part of the kingdom of God today by trusting in Christ as our Savior and our Lord, by receiving the forgiveness of our sins, not based on our own good works, but based on the sacrifice that Christ has done for us. Thank you, Father, for your kingdom, and I pray that we might uh, be ever mindful of its spiritual presence here in our lives and in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As the band comes forward, I do want to point out, I I made a little graphic down at the bottom of your notes to kind of help you with this idea that uh, we are given the seven seals, and, and then out of the seventh seal, by my estimation, we have the seven trumpets that were revealed from the seventh seal, and that the first four Seals are the four horsemen. The last three trumpets are the three woes, just to kind of give you a sense of keeping that in perspective. It's easy to remember that you start with four horses and you stop. Whoa. There you go. 